Good evening. Um, my name is Chris Hines. I'm Deputy Superintendent here in the Conroe Independent School District. And with me tonight is Mr. Chris McCord, our Assistant Superintendent of Operations. And also on our call is uh, Mrs. Sarah Blakelock, our Director of Communications. And so this evening, the purpose of this uh, webinar is we're going to share some information about the process for zoning for the Gordon, Annette Gordon Reed Elementary School, which is going to open up in August of 2022. So with, without any delay, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. McCord, who's going to kind of walk us through, and I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to go through a few slides. Good evening, everyone. We're delighted to be here this evening, and we're going to go through the details of the Annette Gordon Reed School currently being built on McCaleb Road. So as we fast forward to the second slide, uh, we have a picture of a computer rendering of the front of the Annette Gordon Reed Elementary School. This would be seen if you're looking from the north after you came in off McCaleb Road. Uh, Annette Gordon Reed is similar in design to Suchman Elementary and Hope Elementary already occupied currently within the Conroe Independent School District. Uh, one different uh, difference would be the front facade is a little different between Suchma and Hope and Annette Gordon Reed. Uh, also worth noting, just like Suchma and Gordon Reed, uh, just like Suchma and Hope, Annette Gordon Reed is a two story building, but it is going to be fabulous. We think people are really going to be excited about the building, the aesthetics, and going to school there. We're stop ready to open it and think everyone's really going to like it. That opening will be, as Dr. Hines had mentioned, in August of 2022. So there currently is an attendance boundary committee. We'll be weighing a bunch of factors and data, which we'll be talking about much of that today. And depending upon the recommendation of the attendance boundary committee and ultimately the decision of the school board, that elementary school will either be pre-K through four in configuration or pre-K through six in configuration. As mentioned, it will be located at 2045 McCaleb Road. And the next slide that Dr. Hines will show, this is a drone view looking from the Northeast. You can see the building that we are so excited about. You can see the front facade there as uh, Dr. Hines points to it right there, right there. And some things just worthy of note, you can see McCaleb Road. And you can see Michaela Road. So from the right side to the top left, I would be driving from north to south. Some points of interest, a little past the cursor as I go down south on 20, on uh, Michaela Road. Once it crosses 2854, it becomes Fish Creek Boulevard. About 2.9-ish miles down on the right is Stewart Elementary. It's located on the right. You can see FM 2854 running west to east and east to west. If we can go back to the previous slide, Dr. Hines, uh, just a couple of more things to note. And right here, you can see I really like, as a former principal of 20-something years, I like the queuing space. This is going to be great for parents and guardians in the community and people driving on uh, McKayla Road. We'll be able to get a lot of people off the road and into the parking lot. I really like the fact it's a four-wide drive where you come in. If you see the four-wide drive to accommodate four cars, at a time, in theory, uh, that is built just to help with queuing space and flexibility of the car line at the school. But also worthy of note, if you look to the left, also known as the east, uh, we have land to accommodate potentially an intermediate school to be built. It would depend on data and students that move in and the school board's decision. But this site could potentially hold two buildings in the future, which would be a real advantage to students and parents. So we're excited about the whole complex and hope you are too. So moving on, we'll look at this in the first, the slide before us was from a drone. This one is from a satellite 370 miles in space. And it gives you a real good look of the Conroe High Feeder from I-45 to the west. So if you look at it, a great place to start is Annette Gordon Reed Elementary. That is the yellow square located just north of 2854 to the far west. If you can make your way down south, maybe you can see it. Maybe you can't. Stewart Elementary is just at the very bottom of the screen. As I make my way over, I can go to the bottom right. I can see the very corner of B.B. Rice. So B.B. Rice may be... Uh, in play here for discussion. Also, just another couple of buildings of interest would be uh, Giesinger. And we'll talk a lot about Giesinger as it's seeing some explosive growth in the next few years. And in Cryer Intermediate, and Cry I mentioned Cryer Intermediate because uh, uh, Stewart is pre-K through six. So since it, it encompasses fifth and sixth grade, 
the fact intermediate schools in fifth and sixth grade may be in play here also. So there's a satellite view. It just gives you a look at a relationship to the buildings. Uh, and you can see where the loop 105 and 2854 lie. So moving forward to our next slide. This is going to be an elementary attendance boundary zone. And I think this is important. It shows you where campuses that we will be discussing where they reside, but also the attendance boundaries and how they look. So that's really important to understand. And the best place to start at the process would be at Stewart Elementary on the southwest side in the far left corner, bottom left corner. And that is number 57. One thing that will stand out when you look at the screen, you'll see the Stewart Elementary Zone designated in lime green. So it's really large as Stewart Elementary at this point in time, as we speak, is the only elementary school open on the west side of the Conroe High School feeder. But if you make your way up Fish Creek and you cross 2854, you'll come to 64, and that'll be a Nat Gordon Reed Elementary School. And so it is not having a, a represented attendance boundary committee uh, it's in this boundary shown in this picture, which is why we are here today. Just going clockwise around just a couple of uh, schools to note that will be really intricately involved in our discussions. Really one is, is number 10. Number 10 is Giesinger, and it has the blue, uh, light, baby blue shaded attendance boundary. Giesinger is something really to discuss. Just going down, you can see Reeves at number 27. B.B. Rice, number 19, which is in the uh, light green. You can see Armstrong at number two, and then really a couple of to note that we'll be talking about considerably would be Runyon and Teal, number 21, and number 50 down lower in the southeast quadrant, which would be Bonnie Wilkinson. So those are just, that just gives you, and this will be available on the website, the relative positions of the different elementary campuses, as well as their attendance boundaries and where they extend as of this exact moment. So that's important to note. Uh, just talking about intermediate zones, in which once again, talking about intermediate zones, mainly because Stewart encompasses pre-K through six, fifth and sixth. You can see that Stewart right now is the predominant represented pink slash red zone on the west side or left side of your screen, represented by number 57. And then you see Gordon Reed up at 64. In this particular PowerPoint slide, I would draw my attention to number 41, Cryer. And Cryer is peeking behind Giesinger. So you see 41 right where Dr. Hines has his cursor. But Cryer will receive a lot of attention as we go through these discussions in the coming weeks and coming months, as uh, it is really looking for some, to see some explosive growth for Cryer also. You can see Travis in town, number 14. And you see Bosman, number 49, over on the right-hand side, more to the east-northeast, represented by number 49, with a really large attendance boundary for, for Bosman at number 49. So that just gives you relative positions. And once again, these are at our website, and they'll be on this presentation if you want to look at it. Here is the elementary uh, school zones. But what is uh, neat about this, and I think really helpful in understanding the process, is it superimposes the high growth areas in Conroe. And when you look at it, the first thing that probably stands out to you is that there are high growth areas everywhere in, in the Conroe High School feeder over all the quadrants of the feeder for Conroe High School. So we're predominantly looking west, but we can look at, at anything and everything. But if you look at it, you'll see that there is a lot of, of rapid growth in the areas encompassing uh, the schools that we're gonna look at a lot, including Cryer, Annette Gordon-Reed, obviously, Stewart, maybe even B.B. Rice, Wilkinson Runyon. And you can see that we have schools. The Annette Gordon-Reed is stationed at an area of high growth, and Stewart is in an area of high growth. But we have growth everywhere. Worth noting, and I talked about this last week at a meeting, uh, it came out a couple of weeks ago, the United States Census Bureau has given out a statistic that the city of Conroe, or Conroe in general is one of the 10 fastest growing cities in the United States of America. And that is a big deal. And uh, there were four in Texas and we were the only one in the greater Houston area. So uh, people desire to live in Conroe. They want to come to Conroe ISD. They want to come to the city of Conroe. And so there's a lot of growth. And so we need to plan for it. So that's one reason we're here today. So we'll move on to the next slide. You may be asking, why is it necessary to adjust attendance boundaries? And there's, there's a lot of reasons, but number one, for the mention, reasons mentioned before, 
we're having explosive growth. And with, with that comes students and families that we're happy to have. And uh, so we need to build schools to accommodate that growth. But besides the additional students, you know, over time, you can see a uh, shift in an area, a shift in student density, and it can be an aging of an area, the renewal, or we may just need to adjust boundaries because the school has become overcrowded or a school may become underutilized. So we don't try to build buildings where we don't need them. We try to be strategic and thoughtful and mindful of where we build buildings. So moving on to the next slide, uh, just for some statistics and some uh, read a little bit of data to you here. So we ended the 2020-2021 school year last year with 65,428 students. On well, so September 16th of this year, we had 66,785. If you consider the kids that were in the virtual program, we actually had 67,485. So there's a lot of kids and we're happy to have them. Uh, just some things to note, our district-wide, not just to Conroe High Feeder, but district-wide, our kindergarten through fourth grade enrollment was 20, over 25,000. Uh, we have a total seat capacity of 26,000 and change, and we use 89 portable classrooms. For our intermediate students, which corresponds to grades five and six, we have 10,000, just at 10,000 students for the whole district, and we utilize uh, 14 portable classrooms. We're at about 95% capacity. Junior high, seventh and eighth, we have over 10,000 students in a capacity of 10,575, and we are currently using 36 portable classrooms across junior highs all across our district. Our high school enrollment was 20,585 with a capacity of 21,950, so we are under 100% at the high school level. We do currently use 28 portable classrooms and we currently use 167 portable classrooms throughout the building, throughout the district. The uh, 2028 projection for the Conroe High School feeder elementary schools is 9,374 students. So the 2028 predict, predict, projection, just around six, a little over six years from now, We'll have 9,374 K through four students in the Conroe High School feeder. So that translates to a need of around an additional 1,475 kindergarten through fourth grade students after we've opened Gordon Reed Elementary, because our total, uh, total capacity will be uh, under that. So that's where we're going. And as far as the 2028 projection for Conroe High School Intermediate Schools, it would be 4,904 pupils. With the opening of Gordon Reed, we'll have a capacity of 3,150 seats, fifth through sixth grade in the Conroe High School feeder intermediate. The translates to we need about another 1,750 seats for fifth and sixth graders in the Conroe High School feeder within the next six years. So just honing in on some of the campuses that could most directly be impacted, although there may be others with the uh, opening of Annette Gordon Reed, uh, Stewart Elementary, pre-K through six currently has roughly around 950 students for, as a total capacity. It has an enrollment of a 1,121 students now with two portable classrooms and it's at 150% of capacity. So to wrap your brain around this in about a year 2028, Stewart's projected to be over 2,000 students. So uh, I think around 2,097 students. So over double its capacity in just a few years. Giesinger, which is prominent in our discussion, has an enrollment right now of 780 students with a capacity of 650 and utilizes eight portable classrooms. Patterson is a little bit removed geographically speaking over on the Northeast side but it has an enrollment of 896 and a capacity of 925 is expected to grow. Bonnie Wilkinson over to the east from the uh, Stewart area has a capacity of 900 and a current enrollment of 799. However, it is projected to rise to 1100 students by the year 2028. Runyon Elementary also to the east has, to the east has a capacity of 575 students. It has an enrollment of 585 students as I speak, but it's projected to be almost double that, not quite, but around 900 students by the year 2028. Cryer Intermediate, a fifth and sixth grade campus in the Conroe High School feeder. It has a capacity of 900 
Currently, it's 754, so it's sitting fine at the moment as I speak. But in just a few years, it's projected to be at 1100. And then Bosman Intermediate, it's on the other side of the feeder zone. It is a capacity of 950. Currently, it's at 939, just under capacity. But it's projected to also be within a high growth area and reach 1100 students by the year 2028. So we're going to look at this a different way. And I'll go through this next slide in an expedited manner. But if you look at the intermediate schools are at the top, fifth and sixth grade, it shows you we talked about Bosman. I would pay special attention here to Cryer. If you look at Cryer, once again, 1,133 students in just a few years with a capacity of 900. Stewart Elementary, you have to do some math here. It actually has uh, 1,088 students, 1,121 if you count those in the virtual program. So Stewart Elementary is looking at around 1,121 students today. But Stewart Elementary, also known as pre-K through six, headed to 2097. So it is going to anticipate some rapid expansion as far as the number of pupils attending the school. Other schools just going down, Giesinger, if you look, you can look at all the data in the chart and you can see it's going to nearly double in size from its capacity in just a few years. So we'll, we will need to do some things to help bring some relief and address Giesinger. Rice also could possibly need a little bit of help as could Runyon, and Wilkinson. So there are some hard, fast numbers. Those will be at our website and also in this presentation if you want to go back and review them at a later time. And I believe the next slide belongs to Dr. Hines. Let me unmute here and um, we'll go ahead and kind of take you through a few things. You know, I think the first the first question as we kind of go into this process is what are we trying to accomplish? And you know, that way we know if we've achieved it or not. And first and foremost, uh, the objective of this process is to develop an attendance boundary to populate Gordon Reed Elementary School. So it's our new school. And we do want to, as we populate it, we don't want to overfill it. We want to leave a little bit of room for growth because we do know there's some growth coming in uh, on that, on that uh, north side of 105 in that area. So we want to be mindful of that. Uh, we also want to provide crowding and relief and future capacity to Stewart Elementary. So we want to do that, um, as well as look at some of the other elementary and intermediate schools. Now, we also, you know, and this is probably one of the parts that's most difficult to this process, is we also want to be mindful of what's coming down the road. And um, because we really have always have a history of doing this, we try to be deliberate and not move people and then turn around two or three years later and move them again. And so, um, you know, as was we, we shared in the earlier data, this is a fast growing community. We're gonna to continue to grow. We're gonna to have to add some schools in the future. Um, and so we know that there will be other elementaries that come on. I, I anticipate the next elementary in the Conroe area will be on the east side of the Conroe High School feeder. And we'll be doing this again, right? So we'll be looking at who goes to that school. And so we wanna be mindful of, you know, we're gonna open seats. We wanna take advantage of the seats but we also want to be careful to not move people that we've turned around and moved back in three or four years. So um, we are looking at that and we want to be mindful of that. We also understand that this is a challenging process because schools are communities and, and oftentimes families have a history of going to a particular school. You may have selected the home you live in because of the school's reputation. We understand that and we do not take this lightly and we, we go into this very, very carefully. Um, and so we do understand that. Uh, we also understand that we're opening a new school and we do have, somebody's gonna have to go there, right? And we have to be mindful of our resources. So we're gonna look at all those things. We're gonna be very uh, careful as we can. We're gonna try to not impact more than we have to in order to achieve our objectives. To do that, we have a committee put together that has a parent and a principal representation from our campuses. So we're really trying to make sure we have a lot of people at the table. Um, there will also be opportunities for you to submit uh, information and ideas as well. And so I'll, I'll share that a little bit later on how you can do that. So, um, and, and again, we're always available either through email or phone call or, or, or communicating through your principals, another way to get information to our committee. So we do have uh, also some district resources that participate. Um, not everybody votes on that process, but we do have um, some feedback. In addition, we'll also have this presentation available um, and we'll translate it into Spanish in case you want a Spanish version of this uh, presentation. 
So we do have some goals that we are uh, we do look at and we try to be mindful of. We want, first and foremost, our, our commitment is we're going to have a quality school. So we feel confident as a school district and we feel confident that we can uh, develop and set up and, and open uh, an outstanding campus that anyone would be proud to have their child attend. Uh, and so we that's our goal. And we're going to we're going to do that. Uh, we also want to draw boundaries which support the efficient use and effective use of our school facilities and resources while uh, maintaining our fiscal responsibility to the public. And that simply means we're not going to open a school and not put anyone in it. And or we're not going to leave a school, um, you know, a third crowded while another school has 10 portable classrooms. We're just not going to do that. We've got to take advantage of the, of the resources that we have. Uh, to do this, we also, one of our goals is to have a, a process, a, a, an attendance boundary committee that develops, and, and they really work alongside me and, and, and Mr. McCord as we facilitate this process. Um, and for the purpose of developing scenarios that we will bring back and we will share with you um, later, and we'll probably start putting some of those up in the next few weeks on our website. And so I'm going to show you the website here in a little bit so you can kind of uh, keep track. And then we also, through this process, want to plan and for future growth. And uh, we also want to plan for future schools. We want to re reduce enrollment in our crowded campuses. And then we want to communicate um, so that people know that here's what we're looking at. And here's what we're going to do. There's a lot to consider. We've talked about a few of these already. We, we consider the campus capacities. And one of the things that Mr. McCord shared is we're full. I mean, really, when, you, you know, when schools are really more than 90%, they're full and our campuses are very full right now. Um, we know we're gonna need some more schools in the future to serve our students. Um, and campuses can get, you know, it's one thing I will share about campus capacity, it's kind of a moving target based on programming, based on um, class sizes, based on efficiency. It's really funny, I can have a school with, with, with two students move in and we have to add another teacher uh, at that grade level. And so if that happened at four grade levels, then suddenly we needed four more teachers than we planned on, which requires four more classrooms. So it, it is it is a moving target with capacity. We also are gonna look at uh, the input that we receive. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, demographic factors. We're gonna look at history and feeder patterns. And so we look at that, like which elementaries feed into which intermediates or which intermediates feed into which junior highs. We're gonna look at geographical proximity uh, some of that we can improve, some of it we can't, and sometimes we make it worse through zoning, and we, we know that, and we try to be mindful of that. Um, we also look at the location of existing neighborhoods and communities, and by that I mean one of the things we look at is when, the, when, when something isn't there, it's easier to move it before it's there, and so we, we try to be mindful of that. Um, we also look at natural boundaries, uh, natural thoroughfares and roads. Uh, we want to minimize impacts on families, so that's part of thinking ahead, like as a chess game, we want to kind of think two or three moves ahead. Um, and then we want to be uh, mindful of possible future schools and projected future enrollments, as well as transportation patterns, which is one of the reasons we asked Mr. Davila, our director of transportation, to consult with our committee and give us feedback on some of the things we talk about. So to do this is kind of really, you know, this is kind of a calendar of our presentations. We'll do all of these on Zoom. We'll also have some in-person ones. Um, where we'll, we'll come out. Our first one is coming up on Thursday night on September 30th at Stewart. And, and the reason we're going out to Stewart is because it's probably going to be the community where we know we'll have the most impact. And uh, But certainly everyone's welcome. Uh, it also helps you to see the community. As we get closer into this process, we may add some uh, specific ones just to specific campuses. Um, there's three phases to this process. Really, we're just starting in the first the first one. And the first part of this phase is kind of explaining, we're just starting. So we haven't done, we haven't made any decisions yet, but what we're kind of putting out there is we're going to build a new school. We're going to create boundaries. Here we go. We're starting the process. And that's really the purpose of, of tonight. The next round will be in November. We'll come back in November. So between the end of September through early November for the next month, our committee is going to be working on developing scenarios to try to meet our objectives. And we're going to bring back some of these. We're going to be sharing those along the way. And we're going to come back and share those in November. So that'll be very important. And we'll do that through um, one of these presentations on Zoom. And we'll also come back and do it in person. And we record these so they'll be available for, for later viewing. And then finally, we'll come back again in January. We'll take the feedback from those November presentations. We'll try to narrow it before we get to the November one to a few um, that we, we feel good about. Well, based on that feedback, we'll come back. We may tweak it a little bit, 
but we're going to make a recommendation and then we're going to come back and share you what that recommendation is going to be. And then our committee hopes to bring forward to the January board meeting, a recommendation and, um, and that, that recommendation, um, once it's approved by the board, uh, starts a whole nother process, right? So there's this whole process that we really don't start until we kind of start defining who's going to that school. And once we know who's going, we'll go through a process of transfers. We'll go through a process of establishing enrollment. We'll have a principal named in there somewhere. We'll, we'll start to figure out the staffing for that campus. So um, all of that will begin to take place in, in the next um, few months. But, but the big part of that is figuring out who's going to go there because that community is going to be involved in helping to select things like the school colors or the mascot. Um, and, and so each time we have a double presentation, it's the same one. So what, if you are listening tonight, um, what we're going to talk about on Thursday at Stewart is the exact same information. And they'll get the same PowerPoint. And we'll post this PowerPoint as well on the, uh, the website. So that's kind of a, kind of a three-step process. Um, Again, we don't take this lightly. We understand this is serious. We understand it impacts families and their lifestyles. Um, and we are, we are committed to having a quality educational experience at every school. And we feel strongly about that. And then again, just to kind of summarize, our goal is by January to have that recommendation for our board so we can start to do the next process of communicating and, and getting that information out. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to stop sharing so then I can share again. And I'm going to share a different screen. So hopefully I'm going to go to the right screen. And on this screen, you should be looking at our school district's webpage, the main page. And so if you open up the Conroe Independent School District webpage, this will come up. I'm actually there. I'm going to look at the roadmap. Uh, to reopening is there, and then you can see some other things that are on there, and you can see Conroe ISD Attendance Boundary Committee, learn more. That's kind of the opening, so if you want to learn more, you can go to that uh, place. Um, there's a description of zoning process, our goals. It's in Spanish as well, and then um, we also have, you can go into this to get more information, so this will take you into our page. This is our committee members. This takes you to the Gordon Reed Elementary website. <clears throat> There's not much there, but as we add more content, as we get further into the year, we'll put some information there when we name a principal and so on. So we'll start to get some of that information out. And then once we you know, are able to, we'll start communicating that way. But, but again, until we know who's going there, it's hard to, to do some of those things. There's an opportunity for feedback. And so um, this is going to be really important to this process. So there's a place where you can um, submit feedback. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So if you click on that, there's a little form that just comes up and put in your name and your email. And you can tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe where your children go to school. And then you can put comments or questions. There's also an opportunity if you want to, if you think you have a good idea for, for some zones, you can upload a file. And you can do it in, or you can just simply um, upload a document describing what you would do if, if that's easier for you to do. And then you can send that in and we'll get it. And it'll come to our committee. Now, one thing I will say is that it takes us a few days to turn ideas into maps or charts. So, um, so any lead time you give us on that is helpful. Uh, this kind of summarizes what we're, where we're at today is the zoning process, just overview. And so that's what we're doing uh, tonight and Thursday. Uh, in November, we hope to have some maps to show you. And that's kind of usually a come and go event. Now for the Zoom, we'll actually walk you through the maps. And we'll do a little bit of that in the in-person as well. But certainly if you didn't get there right at start time, you could come in and 15 minutes later, the maps will be there and you can look at them and give us feedback. Uh, and then They'll, they'll, we'll come back in January once we have, a, as a committee, have selected what we're going to do, and we'll spend that time between November and, and really the, the winter break trying to, to come up with a recommendation, and then we'll come back out and share what we're going to recommend to the board in January. So that's kind of our timeline. There's some additional resources for you. There's the elementary zone map. That's that one that Mr. McCord shared that had the kind of the boundaries of where the elementaries are, the intermediate map, um, and there's a demographic study. And that's a rather large document. That was the last time we did a demographic study. Uh, it's about six years old. Um, it's still very good information. And I would just caution you, don't, don't just open it and hit print. It's like a 300 page document. So 
Um, it's a rather large document and it takes a while to kind of go through that it is a PDF. Uh, and then finally, there's a, there, there's a worksheet. And um, rather than just show you the worksheet, open it, I'm gonna already have it open. So does it, does, can you see the worksheet now? And so hopefully you can see the worksheet. Okay, and so when you open the worksheet, there's gonna be two pages. There's an elementary and the intermediate. And what it is, it's just set up and there's two things I'm going to point out about the worksheet that real quickly. One is the numbers that populated in terms of enrollment are what we call geocoded students. And by geocoded, I mean that's who lives in that attendance boundary. The reality about school enrollments is they never match the geocode. For, for our planning purposes, we use geocoded, which means the student that physically lives in the attendance boundary. So that's what geocoded means. That's what you see these numbers. They are geocoded numbers. They may not match the actual enrollment. So you're going to see different documents with different enrollment numbers on there. And you're going to wonder sometimes why they match or don't match. One of the reasons that a school schools generally have more students than who's geocoded, because oftentimes teachers at that school might bring their children to that school. In addition, we might have a special program at uh, some of our schools that have cluster programs. So not every school has an early childhood PPCD program for our students with special needs. So um, they might, students from three schools might attend one. Not every school has a bilingual program. So schools from two schools might attend one. Um, not every school has um, a, a behavior unit. So we might have students that come over for attend a particular unit or a life skills unit. Um, generally, all of our schools will have uh, basically resource and in-class support in the special needs program. Um, uh, Pre-K is, is needs-based, and so not all of our schools offer pre-K. We currently have pre-K at Stewart. We only have one section of it. So when we open uh, Annette Gordon-Reed, we may not have pre-K at both campuses, so we may offer it just at one. Um, but that's part of what we do with this process. But again, some of those decisions won't be made until we know who's going there. And so um, that, those are decisions that are made administratively kind of after this process. But we look at it along the way because we want to understand what the options are. But uh, those are decisions that we make later on. So programming decisions are made usually after we define the attendance boundary. So what you're going to see are geocoded. And the way this works is if you had a, a section, if you saw an area at uh, for example, you said, well, I saw an area at Giesinger and Giesinger is kind of crowded. I want to move it over to Gordon Reed. You can just basically pick the zone. It has the description of the zone and the number of students in the zone. And you just cut it and you paste it over in this gray box here. And this will populate Gordon Reed. It'll automatically add it and it'll automatically deduct the students uh, from the other campus. So that's how you use that worksheet. Uh, so if you want to create your own attendance boundaries, I encourage you to play with it. The one, the one thing that I will uh, caution about in this process, and, and I saw a question about that earlier, is Stewart is a K-6. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a pre-K through sixth grade elementary school, meaning students, and those of you that don't have students at Stewart that are listening in, um, students at Stewart don't go to Cryer or Travis or Bosman Intermediate. They stay at Stewart for intermediate school. And uh, so those of you that are parents at Stewart that are on our call this evening understand that. So when uh, students come to the uh, K-6, they stay all the way through sixth grade. So that's why we have an intermediate page. And when we take students out of Stewart for elementary, we got to make sure we go back to Stewart and move them in intermediate if that's our intent. And I will tell you that we're going to look at um, the question about fifth and sixth grade. I think um, if you... If no one's asked it yet on our q and I'm sure someone's thinking this, which is, will the school be a K-6 to or pre-K-6 to like Stewart? And the answer is, we don't know yet. Um, we're trying to figure that out. We're looking at a lot of educational questions with that. And really what it comes down to is this. And, and I apologize for kind of oversimplifying it. But when we split a school like that, um, generally, it works pretty well with 22 to 1 in classrooms, but when we start splitting fifth and sixth grade, it starts to impact other programs, and I'll use an example of band. So if our fifth grade is real small, 
our band gets really small and our orchestra gets really small and our choir gets really small. And some of the offerings that we have at electives are impacted on that. And so we try to be mindful of how that plays out. And there's a point where we don't want to be too small, where it might impact the quality of preparing students for junior high and making sure they're prepared. Cause that's our goal. Our goal is when our students leave that school, they have the right experiences and the right preparation that they're going to be successful uh, when they get to peak junior high or whatever junior high they're feeding into. So that's our goal. And so we are, we are looking at that. We do know that if we do start small, there's also the possibility we'll grow back into it. So, um, but that's why there's two pages. There's an intermediate page and there's an elementary page. We are not, um, you could have a zone that's moving from Bosman to Cryer and you could have a zone moving from, or Bosman to Travis or Travis to Cryer. So those can move, you would just cut and paste those accordingly. And, and they always keep the color of the school they came from. That helps us when we look at it, we kind of know where you cut it from and where, where it got set to. So that kind of helps us, that's why it's color coded. So I would encourage you or ask you, don't please change the colors on those because they're intended for us as a key, kind of understand where the zone came from. If you choose to kind of create your own boundary zones and send those to us. So that's what that zoning worksheet is. You can download it um, on our webpage. I'm gonna go back and put our webpage back. Hopefully you're seeing that. And this is where it is right here. You just click on the zoning worksheet and it opens. Now we're gonna go through a few, uh, Q and A's that we've had. I know I've got a couple that are not on our uh, screen as well. Um, you know, we just talked about grade levels, which are, which grade levels are gonna be impacted right now. We know it's at least K to four, it's a possibility of being K to six. Um, and some, someone else asked the question, is it possible that Stewart could change to K to four? Yes. Is it possible that Reed could open, Gordon Reed could open K to four? Yes. Um, those are both possibilities in that scenario. Um, and those are things that we're looking at. Uh, and both of them can open as K to sixes. So that's a possibility as well. So um, those are things that we're looking at and we're gonna look at and try to make the best educational decisions. Uh, I sh briefly touched upon this question, how are special programs such as bilingual education, special education impacted by zoning process? And the answer is they are impacted because at the end of the day, once we, once we do our zones, we kind of look and see where our space is and where our students are that are in these programs. And we try to put the programs where our students are. Um, but some of our programs don't have enough students to be at every school. So we cluster those. And when we do that, we try to bring students um, together where it makes sense. Currently, for example, we do not have bilingual at Stewart. Uh, I believe those students go to Reeves for bilingual services. So they go over there for class um, because we don't have enough students to do that. At some point in the future, we may. And so we, we always look at that program on, a, on an ongoing basis. I uh, already mentioned pre-K. We have pre-K at Stewart. I don't know if we have enough students to justify having pre-K at both Stewart and Gordon Reed. And so once we do the zone and we see where our students are, we'll look at that. But the good news is they're close by. So if you normally went to one of the schools and you didn't have it, we would just go to the other school for it. Um, suppose my child's in the last year of his or her campus. Will my student be allowed to finish out at that school? And the answer to that question is yes. We've traditionally allowed families to always finish the last year at their home campus if they can provide transportation. And then the follow-up question that we generally get, what about younger brothers and sisters? And the answer is they can stay for that year as well um, because we understand from a family, it just doesn't make sense to be at two different locations for the carpooling. So uh, we do that, but that would involve a transfer process. That pr transfer process usually goes earlier than the traditional one, which is usually towards the end of the year. This one will come up in March, usually before spring break, early March. We put this one up and we try to do that so we can, again, identify how many students are going to be at each school so we can start the transfer staff. Because the reality is, as a school, if a school loses students, then teacher positions would transfer um, with, with those students over to the school. Um, I noticed our school is in this discussion. Does this mean our neighborhood is going to be rezoned? And again, the answer to that is we don't know uh, until we really kind of go through this process. Our goal is to probably not touch more than we have to, but certainly we do know that um, there are some areas that we need to look at. And we, we talked about uh, the number one on the list is Stewart, and that's certainly an area that's going to be impacted because that's where our, most of our future growth is going to be. 
Um, and we also know that's where the new school is going to be nearby. Uh, but we're also going to be looking at Giesinger in this process. So uh, we know Giesinger is going to definitely be impacted. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, in the process, we, you know, Wilkinson and, and Rice and, and, and Runyon, um, Patterson. I do predict um, the next elementary that we build will be in the east part of the district. And so as we go to the east, we want to be mindful of that and, and try not to do a double move. Uh, how many students might possibly rezone? Again, we don't know the answer to that till we, till we actually kind of work through the process. Uh, our family specifically purchased our home to attend the schools, which we are currently zoned. You know, why are you looking at rezoning? And the answer is just as we've shared, it's because we're crowded and we, we, we're growing and we've got, a, we've got a new school opening. So we're going to populate that school. Uh, again, it's not something that we enjoy doing or want to do, but this is a process. And so uh, what we will want to ensure you is that we're going to look at it carefully and try to do what we think is the, in the best interest of everyone. Um, you know, are there more meetings scheduled? I've shared some of that about where our schedule is. Um, you know, I, I got also that question about, you know, kind of that what's next and um, what's next is I said, we're going to, we're, go, we're digging into the process. So that's our next process as a committee. And so if you're going to submit ideas or suggestions for how you might draw the boundaries those really need to start coming here in the next couple of weeks. Um, and, um, you know, um, so there's some, there's some things that are coming in. We're seeing some comments, uh, you know, will kids be grandfathered and steward if a child is not in their last year? Um, you know, and generally that's, that's usually not been the case. Um, uh, obviously if we have some, some issues with space and things, we'll always look at it or if there's some special circumstances, but that would probably go through a normal transfer process. So there's two, two parts of the transfer process. The first one is I have a child finishing the last year and they might have some siblings. And then the, that's what's gonna happen in that March. The other one is kind of the second part of the normal part of transfer process, which is based on space and based on some other factors. And so that would be a request. If someone made a transfer request, you would go through that second part of that process. Do we know what percentage of wood force is built out for future growth? I do not have that in front of me. We do know it's not built out yet, um, but it's getting close. And of course, there's always the possibility that uh, we could have some, um, and developers have done this before where we think they're finished and then they add sections or they add some property and then they expand their development. So who knows what the future is, but um, I will share this about Wood Forest. If you're not familiar with that community, it's a community that's actually split, split between two school districts. So uh, part, of this, part of the community attends Montgomery and part of it attends Conroe Independent School District. So um, not all parts of Wood Forest are in our school district. And so we, we tend to pay real close attention to the parts that are in our school district. Uh, that was a great question. And um, I think those are the main things from the, from the webpage. I'm going to stop my share. Uh, you know, there's, I know we've gone, gone through a lot of information quickly. And again, you can certainly reach out to us if you have specific questions. Um, you know, but we are looking at um, you know, one of the questions I saw was that, you know, we looked at making Gordon Reed like an upper campus, and we, we've actually kicked that around a little bit, like a lower and an upper campus. So you'd have like, you know, one would be a pre-K to three, one might be a four, five, six. It gets a little tricky on the number side. Um, you know, is it possible? It's possible. And, you know, those are certainly, that is something that's already been put into the discussion mix. Um, you know, whether or not the school site behind Gordon Reed would be a junior high, it's not typically the size of a, of a property that we would put a junior high on because of ball fields and practice fields and a track. So um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but that, I don't, don't know if that's, if there's enough room on that site for that, but certainly the, really the, the, you know, the, the final product of what, becomes next door to Gordon Reed is yet to be determined, right? We just know we own that piece of property, but it's roughly about uh, 20 acres back there. Um, so it's generally we would put a junior high on a much larger site uh, than that. Um, and then final decisions. I know one, one question was about final decisions. And again, I'm going to, um, that'll probably be my last one is again, we're shooting for January. So from a, from a board meeting perspective, our goal is to take this to the January board meeting um, 
from experience, you know, December, January for us is about when we need to really start for us to start making those other decision decisions that need to be made and start making plans and drawing up transportation and all those things. Um, you know, the, uh, that was probably more than likely. And then I know there's, there's a question I saw that popped in about, you know, where I live and where I might go. And again, I don't want to speculate at this point, but, um, you know, I think certainly we're going to avoid that. But as you start to look at maps, you can start to begin to understand what makes sense, right? So if I'm coming from the north, um, we're going to probably look at ways or look at maps to not have you drive by a school to go to another school. Same thing coming from the south. So, you know, we're going to try not to drive by a school to get to another school. We always try to, to, to put maps together that we feel good about that we would want to experience ourselves. So um, certainly those are things that we would look at. So I'm going to, let's see, I think those are the questions that I've seen. Mr. McCord, anything you want to add? Now, if you submit your questions, we'll do our best to answer them and put them at the website. We appreciate you tuning in this evening. Yeah, we're gonna we'll do that too as well, and we'll try to we'll try to get a couple of these up as we get them, and as we receive questions, we'll try to update the website as well. So, um, you know, that's something that we will um, share periodically. Something we did last time, and we'll probably look at doing it again this time. Uh, last year, we went through this process and through through a pandemic, you know, and it kind of is awkward to have a bunch of meetings during the pandemic. But we're going to be out there and do some in person, but but not everybody's comfortable in that setting. And so we try to make sure we do them this way as well. But um, something we'll try this time as well is we'll try to start sharing some of our scenario maps that we go through as we go through them. So people can see some of the things that we looked at. Some we might discount because it may not accomplish everything we wanted to accomplish. What you're going to find, and, and this is going to be a theme through this process, is that there are pieces that are interchangeable. And so um, there might show up on one scenario, we move this area and don't move this area. And on another scenario, it's, it's reversed and it, and it accomplishes very similar outcomes. So those are things that we've already kind of started playing with and looking at. So that is, um, that is a very much a possibility. And, and, that's, and that's a known factor. Um, but we'll try to weigh all of that information as we kind of work through it. But, but the, we'll start as we start coming up with some scenarios that we're ready to release. We'll release those with the, with the numbers. And that, that'll be helpful. You can kind of begin to see, um, you know, things taking shape or possibilities. Okay. If at this point, I don't think I see any more. Um, oh, when will you post the scenario maps? We'll probably post those as we, as we have those coming out. Um, we've started working up some. We have our next meeting next week, so we kind of took a week off, and um, really we're getting kind of rolling up our sleeves as a committee and really getting after it next week, but we have already started putting some scenarios together. We have a few, um, but we haven't really reviewed them much, and so we'll go back and take a look, and then once we kind of go through, um, we'll start to put some out. At some point, we want to put out which ones we're not going to be considering anymore, and there could be a variety of reasons why we're not, and we'll want to share that information, but that's a great um, that's a great question, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks, definitely between now and November, right? So this next month is going to be a real kind of a working time for us to start putting ideas down and it's kind of a brainstorming process. Some of them are going to be good. Some of them are going to be bad ideas and we know that. And, you know, just like the question about, have you thought about, have you thought about, yeah, we've thought about both of them being K6s. We've thought about, and we're going to think more about it. One being a K4 and one being a K6. We've thought about one being a K3 and one being a four, five, six. So those are all things that have been in discussion, but they all have implications, right? They all have impact and uh, they all have, um, you know, an upside and a downside to them, whether it's things like transportation or staffing or shared resources and so on. So, um, you know, but those are things that we're going to keep looking at and, and talking about throughout this process and try to come up with a plan um, that does make sense for our, our community. Um, but one thing we do know is that, uh, and I will tell you, I went through it when we opened Stewart, you know, when we opened Stewart, it was not a very big school and we grew into it. And, you know, and, and so if it shrinks down, it's going to grow back and uh, you know, Gordon Reed's going to, whatever, however we open it, it's going to grow. Um, and so it may take a little while, but we'll get there. And, and they're, they're gonna, our commitment is we're going to have outstanding schools. So Mr. McCord, anything else? I think. No, that's all I have. Appreciate you. All right. Um, and then the last question got it. 
you want to answer this one live? Will I get notified by my son's current school or email if my son will be zoned to a new school? Do you want to answer that one? We will definitely notify you. Yeah, you will. We will notify. We'll be notified. You. So what we'll do is, once we have official, like we don't notify people until it's official. But once we know this is going to be the change, we'll send out a notice and say, "Here's the map, and here's where you're going to go to school." And so, um, yes, but we'll let you know when we know. We don't don't know that yet. And then, if we are wanting to continue our child to attend the same school, how would that work? And again, as I mentioned. That, that question is, you know, how do I stay at the same school is that's through the normal transfer process, right? There's a normal process you apply and it's based on is there space and a lot of factors. So, um, you know, one thing I will tell you is at schools that are real crowded, obviously we're not going to want to have people keep transferring into it. So, you know, that's a big consideration in the transfer process is where do we have room and where do we have space, but, but certainly that's part of that transfer process. So there is a, there is a process, but I don't want to confuse the two. The one I talked about is a child finishing out their last year at the campus. That's something that we do. We, we guarantee that um, anything beyond that is through the normal transfer process. And that's based on, like I said, several factors, but most importantly, is there room at that school? So um, and we're going to wrap it up this evening. Thank you for joining us. And again, um, we'll have information. We'll update our Q&A as we get going through this. But thank you very much for being with us this evening. Uh, we appreciate you joining us.